Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. No, no, no. <laughs> All of a sudden, I don't remember what our music sounds like. <laughs> okay, live <laughs> folks, stand by. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's beautiful. The music went. We didn't hear it. Yeah. We have a live audience now watching us going, what the hell are they doing? Hi, guys. <coughs> oh, live podcasting. That's good. Were we live before or after I licked the microphone? I don't know. Okay. I'm going to lick it again just so we can say. <laughs> okay, so here's what we're going to do, because I can't, I got to stop the live stream to get the music working. We're going to do like a... Are we going to get like an old school, like a, a production thing where they're like, three, two, one, bam. No. I mean... We could just go and you could put the, put the inner entrance. That was, that was where I was yeah. going. Yeah. Time is more fun. That's a good idea. That's a good Maybe idea. Maybe we could go. I got it. We'll you go to the store. Cuts. We'll buy the live, the <laughs> click yeah, thingy. The but thing. we're, the whole, we're there to be here live. Why don't we go to the store and find a clicky thing? That's a wonderful idea. And then we're going to. vodka. <laughs> <laughs> we can make this a good time. Okay. So here, uh, we're just going to be sitting around. And then here in a second, you're going to give us a few seconds. And then you're going to give us an introduction. Yeah, and you're just going to intro. That great introduction that. that you've got prepared. Yes. Yeah. Okay? All right. <laughs> oh, God. This, this, is, this is what's wrong with our show. Shh. The intro's playing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. Hold on. <laughs> I'm putting all that's in the video. Amen, amen. <laughs> hey, hey. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. Purple. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week we're discussing addiction. <laughs> addiction. But before we get started, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Apt Solution. Apt Solution <laughs> from the De Proof Brewery in someplace in Belgium. Um, I know I'm messing up the way to, way to pronounce that, but that's about the best way I could I could come up with it. Yeah. Which means what? Uh, the test brewery. The test brewery. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, as our honorary um, Belgian citizen on the show, I'm, I'm I, I don't think you, you could mess it up. How did you become an honorary are, Belgian are citizen? Are you an honorary Belgian citizen? No, you. Oh, you know, oh, you are our honorary oh, Belgian citizen. Oh, okay. You didn't know? No, so I didn't tell know. tell us how that started. I appreciate that. Uh, oh. uh, I, 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 don't, I don't fucking know, but I'm going to go with it. All right. It's when there was a ceremony. They served beer. That's why you don't remember. Oh. I've been in a lot of the ceremonies. Oh. So while you're pouring that, um, so we're going to talk about addiction. Yes, uh, we are talking about addiction. Like the philosophy of addiction or why we, people get addicted or well, how much know, fun it is to be addicted to something. A little bit of, Good uh, God. A, a little bit of all of it, actually. Um, so I, I, first of all, I, I want to say this because there's going to be a lot of people who take different opinions as you do on the show and say, ha, huh, you have justified my pre-existing belief. Uh, that beer is goddamn beautiful. We are not scientists. We are not qualified to be scientists, so existing and standing and established data is what it is. We're not. What? Nothing. We're, we're we're not trying to to upend that, but I think where we can, as philosophers, come in, uh, and rightfully so, is reinterpreting existing data. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So so that's kind of where we're going. So. Probably the, the, the first half of the show or so is just going to be uh, regurgitation and discussion around what the existing data says on addiction, and then we can get into a few more philosophical questions about addiction. Okay, okay. So I want to start uh, and, and give some credit here because I am largely lifting a lot of this show off of a, a speech given by another scientist, and I, I don't want to do that without crediting him. So... Um, I want to credit Mark Lewis, and at the end of this video on the end screen, I'll put a little link to the video that I, I got a lot of this info from. Yeah, it's always good to do your own research. So that um, you can you can go watch his opinions yourself. Um, but I want to start, we're talking about addiction, so I want to start with a definition, as we do on many shows. And this definition is from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who... Uh, 
does the bulk of the research on the subject. Um, and their definition is addiction is a chronic uh, relapsing disorder characterized by compulsive drug seeking, continued use despite harmful consequences and long lasting changes in the brain. It is considered both a complex brain disorder and a mental illness. Addiction is the most severe form of a full spectrum of substance use disorders and is medical illness caused by repeated misuse of a substance or substances. Okay. So a few different things here. Um, one, uh, they, they make the assertion that it is caused by the drug. Uh-huh. Uh, two... They call it a, a, a disease. They also call it an illness and a mental disorder. They use all these terms, but basically, they're 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 all ways of saying it's a disease. Yeah. Um, and uh, they they characterize it as uh, both chronic and relapsing. So they say it is not curable. Not curable. That's what chronic means. Okay. Okay. So uh, th- those are some key points that we'll, we'll be discussing later. I, I, I've got a few issues with the definition, but but it, but it's a scientific definition. Yes. So yes. Uh, uh, my biggest uh, just, just just off the bat, yeah. my biggest problem is uh, characterized by compulsive drug seeking, and I think that addiction can be that you can be addicted to a lot more than a drug. Well, and oh, okay, let's be fair. This isn't broadly addiction. This is drug addiction. Okay. Well, so, we need to make that clear then, because. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I've known people that are addicted to many things besides that. And we're, we're going to get into other addictions on the show, yeah. but, but, but okay. we'll, we'll start yeah, here. Yeah, we will. <laughs> okay. Um, it was odd. Apparently, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I feel like we're about to, like, start an addiction. Okay, so let's get a line right <laughs> yeah. here. I don't know. Um, Wait a minute. That was an option? <laughs> yeah, Man. Oh. Okay, so you do uh, realize we drink alcohol on this show, I'm, right? I, yeah, I'm talking about the line. I'm, oh, I'm just okay. pointing out that I'm you don't the do 80s. alcohols in lines. Well, I guess you can. Yes, you just do. Line bam, up. bam, <laughs> bam, bam. Okay, like a flight. Okay, yeah, so here we got in a flight that comes yeah. in a nice line. Fair enough. Yeah, I, yeah. All mine are square. <laughs> just like anyway. you. So uh, I, I want to talk also. You know, next we, we've talked about the the definition of it. I want to talk about. What physically happens in your yeah, brain absolutely. for an addict? And so there are uh, three parts of the brain that are really important to this. First is the prefrontal frontal cortex. Um, and what you need to know about this part of the brain is it is really important to decision making. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the most complex parts of the brain. It's found in the very front, kind of in your forehead, where they shoot you when they kill you. Yeah, that, that's the part of my brain that works the, the, the poorest. The Probably decision making. because you started doing drugs before it was fully developed. I just think I like doing bad things sometimes. Well, maybe it's it's fully developed. It's just in a in an evil way. That, that's well, a possibility. Yeah. That's well, a- uh, what I was referencing there is that your prefrontal corte- cortex doesn't finish developing until you're about twenty four, twenty five, and so that's I one of the screwed. reasons. That's one of the reasons that. Um, they say kids shouldn't do drugs because it can inhibit the development of their prefrontal cortex. That is, I would agree with that. Alcohol too. I would agree yeah. with that. Um, so uh, next is uh, the striatum. Now uh, the striatum is your motivational center. It it determines uh, what your motivations are and, and kind of what you you seek out. Mm-hmm. And the third one is the midbrain. Uh, which is the part of the brain responsible for making dopamine. I love that part. Yeah. Well, uh, and, and dopamine, dopamine. Yes. dopamine you hear a lot about, and they always say it's a pleasure uh, chemical. Yeah. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mark Lewis, actually, he, he kind of tweaks that a little bit. And he says dopamine, yeah, it, it does create pleasure, but it's a lot more about focus. Yeah, I would agree. It, it makes your brain focus in on a goal. Now, that goal could be food, that goal could be sex, whatever yeah. it is. But it, it, it's a focusing hormone. Which is which is why it's so effective in the fight or flight syndrome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that dopamine helps you to, to uh, um, you know, focus on your knee. If there's yeah. a bear chasing you, you want that dopamine. You focus on climbing that tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and running mm-hmm. fast. Yeah. Um, so so uh, d- that's where uh, a dopamine comes in. Yeah. So, um, and so with the, 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 the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, those two will, will talk to each other and dopamine, 
uh, will well, the then, midbrain and the striatum will talk to each other. No, 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 no. The, the prefrontal cortex and... Well, you said the dopamine and the striatum will talk to each with other. With the hormone dopamine okay, in okay, the mix. Okay, yeah, okay, I should have okay. said that wrong. So uh, with the prefrontal cortex and the striatum, those two yes, okay. will, will, will talk to each other and, and they will kind of work on an agreement about something they need to do. Now, sometimes they don't agree. Sometimes... Uh, the striatum will say, you need to focus on this. And the prefrontal cortex will say, yeah, but, you know, I got bills. Yeah. I need to go home and go to bed, whatever. And so that's where dopamine will kind of come in and, 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 and kind of subvert that whole process by feeding in the hormone to make you focus on staying at that club a little later uh, to, to hang out with this chick or w- whatever it is. I knew I liked it, dopamine. It, 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 it kind of reinforces that loop. Uh, so when you have drug addiction, something interesting that happens is it's uh, over time as your addiction builds, the conversation between your prefrontal cortex and your striatum actually reduce. You see a, a, a trimming down of the neurons that exist between those two and your, uh, your synaptic density in that area reduces. So, and, and they found that this activity reduction actually is only prevalent in the presence of the substance you're addicted to. So you may go have a job and, and be very functional and, and seem normal at other times in your life, but all of a sudden cocaine is around you and the, the, the conversation between the part of your brain that, that's responsible for motivation and the part of your brain that's supposed to be steering the ship kind of starts to cut off. And if you want a, an example of this, uh, if you've ever, different people are going to have different versions of this, but if you've ever walked in the kitchen and opened the fridge door and said, what am I doing? Like All the time. Yeah. Or you walk in and, and that is is your striatum automatically giving you that we're going to do this without your prefrontal cortex having any put input in the conversation. And, and I think, uh, you know, addicts will, will appreciate this, the, the ritual with, with a cigarette. Whenever you walk up to a cigarette pack, grab a cigarette and start tapping on your hand or whatever your ritual is with yeah, it yeah. without ever, you know, kind of... Yeah, you realize you're, you, you're, you're half, you've smoked half a cigarette and, and don't remember lighting it. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, uh, you know, this is my monkey brain, you mm-hmm. know, because I, 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 I reduce everything to my monkey brain. And what I'm hearing with this, I know you're talking all this scientific stuff yeah. with biology, but what I'm seeing in my head is uh, the, old, the old cartoon with the good angel and the demon on, on my head telling me what to do, and one's telling me, telling me to do one, and one's telling me to do another. Am I, am I kind of interpreting this in the right way? I, I, it sounds like a conscience to me in some way. I, I, I don't think you are, because what it would more be like is you're not paying attention, and the evil demon reaches down and grabs your hand and moves it. Uh, be, because it, it, it's really kind of Your angel a, gets stuck in traffic and doesn't show up. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's really kind of a breakdown of that whole conversation where the conversation never takes place. You just reach down and do something. Uh, we can see very extreme versions of this. Now, this isn't addiction-related. This is a completely yeah. different um, thing in the brain. But there's some people who have brain injuries, and they have what's called a ghost hand where, um, the, and, and it's usually caused by a, uh, uh, some kind of injury that <coughs> separates the two halves of your yeah, brain, yeah. where they're not talking anymore, and what they'll report is things like sometimes their hand will choke them in the middle of the night. Yeah, I've seen Or uh, sometimes they'll go over and they'll look in their closets like, oh, I want the blue dress, and their hand will reach over and grab the red dress. Uh, so it, it's really more actions akin to that except for on a much smaller and isolated scale okay. that okay. have to do with your addiction. Um, so, you know, I, I haven't really told you anything except for give you information about kind of what happens in the brain uh, when you, you, you look at an addict's brain. Um, so now I'm going to kind of leave that, let that fester in your mind, and I'm going to jump over to some other things. Um, so there are actually <coughs> other activities that we see very similar reductions in different parts of the brain, of course, but very similar reductions in synaptic density in gray matter. Okay. 
Um, and the most prevalent of these is early childhood development. Okay. So it, it may seem counterintuitive that as you get older, your synaptic density would reduce. But I want you to think of it as trying to make a, a bush sculpture, like bush art. Yep. The first thing you do is you grow the bush huge and bushy, and it looks like crap, and then you shave off all the parts you don't want. That's very much how your brain works. They even still call it. They even call it pruning. Yeah. So you go through these cycles where hormones stimulate synaptic growth, and then they find which synapses work really good for seeing a wall or for uh, uh, having an interesting conversation or whatever the goal is, and they prune out all the ones that don't, and then they they kind of repeat that yeah. cycle. So we see very similar reductions in gray matter. Um, from that, we also see it when people are learning sports, and we see something interesting too. You know, I talked about how the devil kind of grabs your hand and does it for you. Um, there's this thing that's really prevalent in in most forms of of sports called muscle memory. Yeah, where you you don't get up there and think, how do I swing this bat or yeah. whatever. You just see the ball and you swing the bat. Interesting uh, uh, kind of correlation there. I fully understand that that, that that would decay as you get older because I'm at the age now where everything is decaying a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense to me that, that, that you know, your body would, would do, you know, you get really good at some things, but you're less capable of developing others. Well, so the way that that pruning works, I, I, I talked about how it focuses in, but, but your brain is actually built in such a way as to argue with itself. Which kind of makes sense, because I think it's a very natural thing for us to do, is to constantly argue with ourselves. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. Yeah. So what, what we often see happening is when our motivations are decided and we decide to go in a direction in our mind, the part of the brain that is against our motivation, we prune out a lot of because it's not efficient to be fighting yourself on something you want to do. Okay. We can see this process in reverse whenever um, an addict quits doing drugs. So uh, there is another part of your brain that is responsible for uh, impulse control, okay? And whenever somebody quits doing drugs, the the, the synaptic density in that area gets stronger um, to the point that a person who has quit doing drugs for a full year actually has stronger activity and density in the impulse com- uh, control parts of their brain than somebody who was never addicted to drugs. So so the best thing we could do is, like when we're 35, start doing drugs and, and, and for about a year and then quit. Well. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saying that tongue-in-cheek, but, I mean, yeah. you know, is that, is, is that something that's, that sounds scientific, I mean, with what you're saying? Well, and it may not even be too dangerous a thing because something that doesn't get talked about a lot uh, in, in the dialogue on drugs is that most people who get addicted to drugs beat the addiction. It is actually the rarity that somebody doesn't beat the addiction. And this is actually such a, a common and predictable phenomenon that they have done research on different drugs, on individual drugs, and how long it takes to beat that addiction. There is a timeline of beating the addiction. What, but doesn't that, doesn't that defy the very definition of addiction that you gave earlier? Yeah. Because the definition said that it's, you know, it's, it, it, it can't be beaten and it's recurring. Yeah. Yeah. But yet, uh, if you started cocaine today and got addicted, on average, you would quit in four years. Yeah, yeah. If you started marijuana and became a a a, 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 a compulsive yeah. user of marijuana, on average you quit in six years. If you started out, al- you became addicted to alcohol. On average, you you quit in fifteen years. And here's the 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 worst one of it all: if you start tobacco today, on average you quit in twenty five years. Wow, wow. Um, but people quit. I don't think that alcohol one uh, takes into consideration my Scots Irish relatives because. Um, uh, 15 years, I, 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 don't know. I don't know. Well, were they addicted? Yeah. Because, I mean, here in a few years, I will have been drinking for 15 years. <laughs> and, uh, wow, I, I'm glad to know it hasn't been that long. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I'm not addicted. And so the likelihood that I'm going to just stop drinking is 
Uh, I've been legally drinking for a quarter century, so, you know. Hmm. That's nice, Mike. Just, just, just pointing that out. I've been legally drinking for ten years. A quarter century. One tenth of a century. Uh-huh. So, but, but it, it, it's really interesting that 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 addiction, though, like you said, we call it chronic. We can we can pinpoint when you'll quit to an average. Yeah, but but to oh, an average. But but let me ask you: mm-hmm. Does quitting mean that you're not addicted anymore, or does quitting mean you found a way to control your addiction? Because you know, um, I quit smoking for 10 years now. I smoke a cigar, cigars now, but I quit smoking for 10 years. Uh, but during that 10 years, I don't think I ever beat the addiction to it. I just learned, I, I, I wanted one frequently. I just never, I just didn't act on it. Yeah, so so that, that's a really interesting question. And, and I think this is one of those interpretive things because if you look at it as this is something that you like doing enough that, that you will develop an addiction if you do it, then weren't you born addicted? And didn't, and didn't know it until you... Yeah, until the you whole use addictive it. personality yeah. yeah, I do believe complex. in addictive personalities. Yeah. So if you want to look at it like that, then you didn't develop an addiction when the drug became present. You were born addicted and one day found out when you used the drug, you were addicted to it. Yeah. yeah. But if you want to look at it from the perspective that I can quit and I can never use that again, well, then that sounds to me like you... You are like most people in the world who aren't using cocaine or heroin or whatever the thing may be. Um, But if you wake up every day and you're struggling not to, even if you don't do it, if you're struggling not to do it, I think you've still got an addiction. I would agree with that. However, that is not uh, the typical... um, the, the typical response after a period of time of someone having quit. Yeah. Now, they have that memory, and they know, like, yeah, I, I like heroin a little too much. I don't need to use it. But for most people, well, it's not a, a regular struggle for I don't, them. I don't know. that. Uh, I've known enough people that have, that have had serious alcohol problems, not so much drugs, but I've known enough people that have severe, had serious alcohol problems and have quit alcohol and effectively quit it, never drank yeah. again, but they... Every almost every one I can think of replaced it with another addiction. Yeah. Uh, whether that addiction be coffee or uh, or donuts, alcoholics or anonymous out. meetings, yeah. or working out, there's something else that replaces it. So at that point, to me, there's still an addiction. You've just you've found a way to manage it. You're managing well, it. So I actually, and and we'll get into this later. But in quitting, this is actually something that uh, Mark Lewis says is is part of the process that you beat an addiction by replacing it. And he actually gives, gives further suggestions on how we need to relook at how we treat addiction. But he actually says you need to find the thing you want to do, whether it's getting in shape or drink yeah. more coffee and focus on that. And, and you can't just, you can't not do anything. You have to replace the thing you're doing with something else. I would agree. And so he, he actually says, this is just part of the, the process. I want to, I want to go through, and I feel like this this show has been really uh, scattered, but it, it's all kind of it, it's it's going to culminate here. Uh, I want to go through a few things. I've talked about this brain process, and I've talked about um, how your mind reacts and how you you don't see sense whenever you're around the drug um, and everything. I want to talk about some other activities that are not drugs that brain scans look identical. When you you are doing or have these things, okay. Uh, going to work. Now, when I say that, I don't mean your travel to work. I mean when you're in a job and you're you're progressing and getting better and learning your job. Falling in love. Uh, mindful meditation, binge shopping, uh, gambling addiction, video game or internet addiction, sex addiction, porn. Obese people when they come in contact with food, uh, binge eating, which is different than being obese, uh, as well as we see the same activity in the brain when you go to psychotherapy. I would believe that. Yeah. So all of those produce the exact same process in your brain. I, I, have, I have known people that, that I believe are addicted to counseling. Uh, you know, just, just can't function without it. I think it's a, you know I usually it. a healthy addiction usually but uh, but you know I I I've seen these these I'm looking at this I think I've seen all of these 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is where uh, Mark starts to make an assertion. Uh, and he, he basically says that this process that we call addiction is just an occurrence in relation to something society doesn't like of a process that is actually built in uh, to our system. And it's called deep learning. Uh, if you have a sports athlete who goes through deep learning and learns baseball, his brain is doing the same thing that a coke addict's brain is doing. And yes. we are just learning to be really good at using coke or really good at smoking cigarettes or really good at whatever. And it is, it, it is no different in, yeah, in that regard. Yeah, yeah. I, I could see that. So I actually was like, well, hold on. You're making an assertion here. And scientific assertions can be can make predictions, and those predictions can be tested. So I left his research. This is where I'm kind of you know breaking off, and I, I said, if it's true that addiction is just learning, then those who have an aptitude for learning should get addicted easier. Yeah, should have an aptitude for addiction. So I started to see if there was any research showing correlation between IQ and addiction. And there is. Because that's the best measure of I don't know about intelligence IQ. aptitude that we have. Right I don't now. know about IQ, but I know a lot of college professors that, 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 that drink like fish. Yeah. Well, look at um, researchers, artists, uh, musicians, scientists. Like, you look at some of the most incredibly talented and, and intelligent people that we we have yeah. um you know you look at any any uh lifetime achievement list and you know those people are going to uh, seem to have a predilection for addiction i actually have a problem with with looking at it that way um now i don't know that that's wrong but the problem I have with it is if there were a bunch of dumb people, dumb nobodies running around who had more addiction than the, the smart somebodies, we'd never know it. So there, there's yeah. kind of a bias for a sample of data. True. You know? No doubt. Um, but so I'm going to put a link in the description for this, this article. Um, but the National Child Development Study uh, shows that it, more intelligent children in the United Kingdom, so this was in, in England, are more likely to grow up to consume psychoactive uh, drugs than less intelligent children. I'm going to put a, a, a graphic on the screen now. I love the wording here. I, I have a real, I have a real problem with this. But okay. yeah, uh, and, and the biggest reason is I know how, I know how educational data is collected on kids, mm -hmm. and this is going to be uh, without looking at, at at without looking at how this one has been done. Okay, and I'm just telling you from my mm -hmm. own experience in how educational data is collected. Uh, I would bet that this is skewed in such a way that your uh, your uh, wealthier neighborhoods are going to have the higher education kids and your lower class neighborhoods are going to have your lower education kids and your wealthier kids can afford psychoactive drugs while your lower ones can't. Well, so, and, and that actually, if well, that, that how is... How are they categorizing psychoactive drugs, too? Um, because that does not mean psychedelic drugs I, I i i realize i realize that but i but i think the i think the higher ends are more likely to be on that Fine. are you suggesting that poor people are not the ones doing drugs and troves i'm suggesting oh I, I, i'm suggesting that even if that's not true we wouldn't know because that data is not collected yeah. the data is collected on the uh, the upper end of, of, of the educational spectrum. Yeah. That's what we see over and over again. And when they collect educational data, it's your it's your wealthier school districts that participate, not your lower school districts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this was based on IQ tests. And my understanding, though, go read the article and read the study yourself, is that they um, did IQ tests and then and then watched them throughout life to see which ones. Uh, did and didn't develop uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, addictions later. So I, I love the word in here. <laughs> Because it's, it's, it's a British study, they, they have five categories. They divide them up into very dull, which are people with an IQ less than 75, dull with a people between 75 and 90, normal, 90 to 110, bright, 110 to 125, and very bright is anything higher than that. And we actually see the highest addiction rates in the bright, though the very bright is still higher 
than uh, uh, the dull and very dull. Yeah, yeah. I feel like when they did graphs in this study, they probably put the categories as little light bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> Like the very dull is turned off. There's and one then that's like <laughs> dim and one that's like shining oh, bright like a diamond. They, they, they show like Jesus glowing yeah, in a song's furnace. in my head. Thank you. <laughs> but, uh, fuck you for that. So, uh, uh, the, the, the question is, uh, and, and I want to get into the question after we do the beer. But the question that I think we need to, to come back and, and ask is, uh, what does this mean about earlier assertions that drugs cause addiction, that addiction is chronic, and that addiction is a disease? And yeah, and and I want to talk about some counterpoints while we're going through. That. Okay, but all yeah. that said, uh, we are drinking Absolution uh, by what do we call it? The Pro Deprof uh, Brewery. Deprof. 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 Yeah. Deprof, yeah. The Deprof test brewery. brewery. The test brewery. Yeah. In somewhere Belgium. Yes, in Belgium. The Cristo, I think. But do you see the ABV on there? La Christy. La Christy. 9%. <laughs> I don't know. 9% ABV. 9% ABV. Yeah. Um, mm. Who wants to start this one? I'll go ahead and start. Okay. So this, this is not what I'm used to uh, whenever... Uh, oh, this is... Sorry. We have a quad for next show. So I've been thinking this is a quad. I was like... Oh, this is a, a pale ale, isn't it? Yeah. No, this is a, a dark Belgian ale. Dark Belgian ale. I'm sorry. So I've been saying like, this is really good, but it, it does not taste like a quad. And no. there's a reason. It's it not is, a quad. It is not a quad. <laughs> I don't um, do it every time. Yeah. Uh, Most uh, of the time. So now, now uh, uh, that said, uh, where I was going was, uh, this has a very... Maybe earthy is not the right word, but it, it, it's got a very, it's bitter and it's very raw, as if this was not made in a uh, a super over sanitized high production environment. I can I can taste uh, uh, deeper uh, sediments and and sediments yeah, characteristics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, and it, it's it's kind of a, a bitter taste, but it's not an overwhelming bitter. Yeah, it's yeah. not like an IPA bitter or a, a bitter beer face bitter. It's an aged bitter. Yeah, it's very smooth. A lot of times when you think of Belgian beers, you think of sweeter, but this isn't really super sweet. No, it's, it's got it's, the cream of it, though. Yeah, it does, and it's it's well-balanced. Um, and the alcohol, uh, being a 9%, is not super prevalent. It, 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 it's almost hidden in there. Um, that said, I think they did a really good job of making a balanced beer here. I'm going to give it a 3-3. Three, three. All right. You or me, Madam Mistress? No, I don't know. Whatever you want to do. All right. I'll just go ahead. She doesn't know. Um, I really like the beer. I'll just come right out and say that from, from the beginning. Uh, this is my, my second glass of it. Uh, I like the creaminess of it. Uh, you mentioned the bitterness. And honestly, I didn't even notice the bitterness until you mentioned it because it's such a – it's on the back end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have the bell curve that I want in something. It kind of it kind of smacks you in the face, but it's not a. It, it, but it's not. You it's know, not unpleasant. It's not unpleasant at all. Uh, the smell when I first poured this, I love the way it smelled. Uh, uh, the the texture of it's good. A great mouth feel. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in a strange place with this one because um, I was expecting, uh, you, you know, to. Uh, I was expecting you not to. I was expecting you to come about two five. Okay. And uh, uh, I, I'm 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 pissed because you came at a three three because I was excited about being the high, but I'm going three two on this one. I, okay. I really thought I was going to be higher than you. Uh, uh, I, I like it three two. Awesome. So I actually just showed John because I went ahead and put down what I was going to rate it because, and I, I do that every once in a while because I don't necessarily want y'all's. You don't want it to influence. Discussion yeah. to change mine. So yeah. I, I go ahead and like write it down so I'll, I'll stick to it. Um, when you take air in, when you sip this beer, you get some really pleasant mm. fruity notes to it. Um, on the back end, it's the mouthfeel is velvety and Very creamy. not super full, but full. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but then the back end has like some woody notes to it that I really like. Um, not a whole lot of hop to it, but it's a Belgian ale. Didn't need so, it. Right. Um, so that fruit and, and fruitiness and woodiness is really what you're getting a lot of out of it. 
um, I found it to be incredibly pleasant to drink that the ABV is not noticeable in your mouth, though it is noticeable after you've had a little bit. Um, so I'm coming down at a 4.2 with this. I think this Four is two? an excellent beer. Absolutely excellent. Here, here's, here's my problem is I can't tell you why I would disagree with you mm-hmm. because I, I, I everything you said I agree with. Mm-hmm. I feel like it's high, uh, just just because of other beers that we've gone against. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't argue with you yeah. about it. Uh, no, you know? if I if I found this again, I would totally get it. I would too. Uh, yeah. Let me ask y'all this. Y'all, y'all picked this up for our audience. Is is price wise? Is this something that's that's uh, that, that is that's going to sixteen dollars for a bomber? Well, that and, ain't and, bad. That ain't bad for for a good bomber. Let yeah. me also say this: the the place where we got this uh, is actually relatively expensive. It's a little bitty, like. Shop, one person's shop. Uh, it's always the same woman. She's in there drinking wine every day. Or her uh, probably underage daughter. Yes. Not who's not drinking, just working. Well, we don't know. Well, not, not my business. that I've seen. Is um, what I'm anyway, saying. so um, I hope she's not. Tw- I hope I hope she's 24 if she's drinking because her brain isn't fully developed. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you go in there and it's all craft. You cannot find a, a case of There's, Bud Light in there. The worst thing in there is um, what's that really popular stout Guinness. You know, so yeah. yeah, like that's the yeah, worst. Yeah, but you need that. You need that. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Fine. They even have but a dog beer the in there. Worst really? beer. A beer, yeah, a for, beer for your dogs. dogs. You pour it in your dog bowl. That's that's just that's not right. It's not alcoholic. Yeah. I don't care. That's not right. But anyway, so so they 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 only deal in craft beers and wines, and they're a little bit more expensive than you're going to find if you go to Fresh or somewhere else. You know, I don't care. Big, Sixteen dollars yeah. for yeah. this for a bomber. For a bomber uh, yeah. I think that's that, that's perfectly reasonable. I've yeah. had I've had two. You've had a couple, mm-hmm. John. You've had a couple, so we've gotten, mm-hmm. we've gotten about six beers out of this. I mean, yeah. you know, we got half uh, beers. We yeah, could, yeah, you know. yeah. I mean. You could probably get, you could probably get four, four full beers out of this. Yeah. Uh, that's you know, four dollars a beer. Yeah. yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, I, I would definitely do it again. And uh, absolutely, I think uh, you know, if we do another another crazy New Year's show where we try things, this is one that we'd want to have on it. Oh, so one of the things that it actually says on the back of the bottle. Um, is that they expect this to age well. Um, so I kind of want to go back. Um, and, and buy just, 25 more of them? And get one other bottle. and Or 25? Even if we just like buy it personally and keep it, I want to kind of see how it tastes after a year. Well, let's so. get a couple uh, for the show. A case. And we'll do it Let's get a case. Show. Yeah. <laughs> they don't have that many. They have like three. Buy those. <laughs> yeah. I bet they'll get more if you buy those. True. Um, but uh, yeah, that was that was that was quite good. All right, time to play the game. Uh, yeah, who wants to start? Yes, gets you late. Yes, it gets, gets you late. Yes, uh, uh, date. Uh, you, you're gonna you're gonna pull this out on uh, special occasions. Um, I, I'm gonna say not a Hail Mary beer, and I'm gonna tell you why. While I think this is a good enough beer to be a Hail Mary beer, I don't think it's got broad enough appeal to be a Hail Mary beer. But I do think it's a special occasion beer. I, I'm going to disagree with you. Okay. Uh, while, while I think it would be great for a special occasion, if I was making your rating, I think this is the beer that you bring out to impress somebody and show that you know what the fuck you're talking about. I think it's good enough that you could impress somebody. Yeah, I Even think... if they're not a beery person, they're going to be able to taste the quality of it, I think, and, okay. and know that you know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, so I actually think this is a first date beer with somebody out of your league. I, I think it would work there too. You think it's okay. Hail Mary? This I mean, is a, that's what this Hail is Mary an anywhere is. beer. This yeah. is an anywhere beer. Yeah, I mean, it works. Uh, it works. Uh, not a uh, not a lawnmower beer, but you know, we developed a new uh, a, a new ranking. We did beer the other day, or, with or wine. wine the other with wine. But I'm going to put this where the in, in that wine rating that this is this is what I would like to drink when I need to uh, the study beer when I need to focus. So yeah. I need to study. If I'm grading papers, this would be a great beer to do it. Uh, <laughs> I think it would focus my mind, and my students would be much happier with their grades. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I uh, bet. And, and with addiction, we know that you know we can focus our minds. So that's, that's okay. Get that you dopamine can, going. You can train yourself. I'm going to train myself to uh, grade papers while drinking nine percent alcohol. Yeah. So I, I but have not at work. <laughs> not at work. I used to have a uh, a professor who would regularly post on his Instagram because I followed him on Instagram. I have a lot of students that follow me. Oh, yeah, it's weird. But he it would regularly weird. post like a picture of our papers that we had submitted. And like a beer or a wine or I, a 
scotch. I do that periodically. <laughs> I'll go sit yeah. at the draft house and you'll see my papers in a, in a, in a, in a glass of wine or something or a yeah. beer or something while I'm doing. Nice. Yeah. He's, but he'd post stuff like, you'll need to get your shit together. This is tough. Not, that would be when there was scotch there. <laughs> So yeah. so I have a few other notes on how this whole brain process works, and, and we can touch on them at, at points it becomes uh, uh, proper, but I think at this point it's a good point to kind of go off script and, and kind of discuss from this information because it's getting a little bit in the weeds if yeah. we go any yeah. further. What do we think about addiction? Does this change any of our perceptions about addiction? So, uh, go ahead. So I think one of the things that um, the information that What's His Face brings about. Dr. What's His Face. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, dude. The respected Dr. What's His Name. <laughs> like I said, sorry, dude. Um, Mark Lewis. Dude. Um, Dr. Dude. Who, by the way, part of his. Is he a doctor? Uh, yeah, he, he is a, a doctor um, in uh, neuroscience, ah, yes. and one of his credentials is former addict. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So just. But I think he was probably uh, high when he did it. Some of the information that he presents <laughs> begins to actually call into question whether addiction is a thing at all. Um, especially, at least in the sense that we understand it. Now, um, I, I think we can we can definitely recognize that there are. Some things that an addiction to um, becomes problematic in executing other tasks of your everyday life. Yeah. The tasks that we deem to be necessary to be a contributing member of society. Um, but, you know, you, you hear the argument of, like, whatever Tiger Woods got caught cheating with, like, 46 models or something. Lucky shit. bastard. Um. And then he claimed to be a sex addict. People were railing about. Yeah, we call like, it the Michael Douglas syndrome. That's I, actually got a name, the Michael Douglas syndrome. Who's that? The actor Michael Douglas, Kirk Douglas's son, romancing the stone. No, you haven't you hit on anything I've I've understood yet. Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy two. No, that's oh. not. No, that's not him. I like that's Kurt Russell. I don't know. Oh, Michael du- Black Rain, Basic Instinct. Um, I don't know. Great actor, anyway. but he was he was a dick. He got a divorce, and he managed to beat the uh, the, the adultery uh, rap by getting a doctor to say that he was addicted to sex. Huh. But anyway, so uh, Tiger... How do you not know who that is? Good Lord. I don't watch movies. I sleep through movies. That's what I do. Damn. But anyway, um, and so, like, he comes out, says, I'm like, I, I'm a... a addicted to sex and everybody starts going off the rails like you can't be addicted to sex blah 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 if you can be addicted to sex you can be addicted to water and Mm -hmm. when you look at it you according to the definition as we have it now can be addicted to water sure yeah um without it you are not able to perform your regular functions in life it like it definitely disrupts things it is habitual it's chronic um, if anyone's ever fasted, you become, and, and this term is so appropriate when you're doing it, ravenously hungry. Yeah. yeah. That is an, a, an addict's behavior if I've ever seen an addict's behavior. Sure. Oh, sure. yeah. Sure. yeah. You know? um, but, I'll, I'll tell you what it does to me. I'm, am I interrupting you? Oh, I was just going to wrap it up and say, when you look at it like that, I think it becomes difficult to to really kind of continue to define addiction the way that we have. I, I, Here's my problem is, is I believe addiction is a real thing. I, I, I absolutely do. I've, I've known enough addicts in my life that I've seen that they, they just can't function. I'm going to make the, the politically incorrect and probably unpopular opinion that addiction is not a disease. Uh, I do not believe addiction is a disease. I think addiction is, um, you know, it's a weakness. It's, uh, it, it's something that, 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 that we all have to different mm-hmm. levels. God knows I've got an addictive personality. I can get addicted to anything. But on the other side of it, I don't let it ruin my life. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't think it's a disease. I do not believe that it is a disease. I think it's just a mental condition that we are all born with to different levels. Well, and, and I think we're probably going to touch on whether or not it's a disease a little bit more later. But um, while... So, like I said, with the definition as we have it now, I think we can... I think there's an, an argument to be made that addiction is not a real thing. 
I think what you're describing would more accurately be characterized as substance abuse. Which to me is what addiction is. I, I, I think it's a vocabulary thing. Again, like so many things are. Um, if, if, if you're unable to, if you are not capable of stopping the substance abuse, it's an addiction. Um, uh, in my mind. Okay. Uh, so that, that, that's kind of where I am. But again, I, don't, I, don't, I do not think it's a disease uh, it doesn't require it doesn't require medicine to 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 to, to break it. Methadone. Uh, it doesn't. It does not require that. It does help a lot of people, but it does not require it. And you only can in stop certain it addictions. It. Well, I mean, yeah. that's also the case yeah. for a lot of diseases that we know. Well, for a lot of them, but but you know, time you know, time will cure a lot of things. You're you're right. You're right. Hmm. Uh, but we we don't see a you know there's not a uh, there's not a bug that, that that causes it. There's not a it's not a virus. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's, it doesn't meet the definition the of a disease. That's also every me. mental illness. I, well, uh, most, I guess. I, I think most of those are chemical imbalances more than they are diseases. I wouldn't call that a disease either. I would call that a chemical imbalance. Okay. So, you know, to me, if, if we're going to, to ask whether or not it's a disease, uh, when we look at this and find that it is the same patterns as we see in deep learning, uh, I then have to, to kind of point out that... I think drugs themselves, as well as a, a few other activities that, that were mentioned, are prime candidates for, I'm going to use a term now, addiction, because it is an activity where there's always a winner. So, for instance, if somebody becomes addicted to baseball and becomes yeah, the next yeah. Mickey Mantle, they probably did it because they, they realized they had some maybe natural talent and they won a few games and then when they did that, it was like this high that they were chasing, yeah. and that was their kind of addiction. But the thing about doing drugs is you always win. You don't lose when you do drugs. You know, you never have that risk. You know exactly what's going to happen because these chemicals either directly mimic or stimulate other chemicals that give you that winning feeling. Uh, you know, there, uh, even beyond drugs, though, I mean... You can be addicted to uh, uh, attention. Oh, well, yeah. attention. Yeah, attention. Okay? Sure. Because I, I, I mean, I'm right there. Uh, I, I am. I am the happiest man in the world when I'm in front of a classroom teaching, or you put a microphone. When I ran for office, they used to tell me the most dangerous place in the world was between me and a camera. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it's because I like being the center of attention with that kind of thing. That is an addiction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so then I have to ask. Going back to, is it a disease? If we're going to say addiction is a disease, is a disease the structure of the brain that affects every single activity we do and produces Mickey Mantle? Is the fact that that is a thing a disease? Or is it the fact that the 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 thing was focused on cocaine or the yeah. thing society doesn't like? And if it's the second one, if it's the place where we put our focus... Oh, oh, where is the line on yeah. which things are the bad focuses and which things are the good? Exactly. Some are clear, but, exactly. Yeah. but some are gray. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It, 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 it's not a disease if, it, if, if, if it's, only, it's only a disease whenever it has a bad effect. Right. If your addiction is, if I'm addicted to learning or I'm addicted to exercise, we don't want to call that a disease. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and here's another one. Here's a weird one for me. We talked about earlier, if you're addicted to sex, right? Yeah. So... If you're addicted to sex, you say, "Well, that's going to ruin your marriage, and you're not going to you're not going to perform in society, and you're going to be breaking up homes and your own home, and yada yada." But isn't like a big part of our evolutionary biology to have a sex with as many people as possible? Yeah, yeah. Aren't they like the best humans ever? <laughs> I mean, seriously, yeah. so, biologically speaking, yeah. Uh, so you say that you don't think that um, addiction should be considered a disease no. because it's a chemical imbalance. But isn't that what, uh, or, or rather you say mental illnesses are chemical imbalances. Yeah. So would you categorize addiction as a mental illness because it is a chemical imbalance? No, I wouldn't. I would, Why I, not? I just, I, I don't even like the term mental illness particularly. So I have a, I, I just, uh, uh, I, okay. I think it's mental a, defect. Like, well, I mean, I just, I, I'm looking at this. There, I mean, there, there are people that are less developed and that's, that's fine. That's mentally, you're, you're mentally undeveloped, but that to me, that's not a disease. That's, that's a well, disease, is, a disease, a disease, a disease is something that's caused by an outside force, an outside force of something. And I don't think this is, I think this is something inside you. So, so let me okay. ask you this. So if we say, 
and I, I'm not conceding the point. I don't know which side I'm arguing, actually, at this point. Um, but if we say that addiction is not a disease, if I am addicted to cocaine and the hormones in my brain, for whatever reason, don't produce right because they're so used to getting that cocaine, I cannot get happy outside of cocaine, yep. is that chemical imbalance a disease? I don't think so. Uh, well, okay, so here's another question. People get addicted to, to sugars, they eat a lot of sugars, sure. and they don't produce insulin anymore, and we call that a disease called diabetes. No, that's but, a chemical imbalance. No, 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 because because now your body is doing something. It's not in the mind. It's something that's happening in your body. Your body is not producing something. There's, there's yeah, a difference Yeah, your mind there. produces I mean, insulin. Uh, no, your, no, your brain, no, your physical no, your bo- brain. mind does not produce insulin. Or sorry, I was going to dopamine. Uh, but uh, but yeah. well, your mind doesn't produce insulin or dopamine. Your mind is a, no. a non-physical object. That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying that a mental illness is a chemical imbalance, as you characterized it, yeah. which is a physical thing, which is not in your mind; it's in your brain and in your body. And a a an addiction to drugs, an addiction to an activity, is a chemical imbalance so, of your body. I think there's a difference. I, 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 I really do. I, 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 I want to. I, I want to hear this. I, I, I want to hear what you see the difference is, and and why it's a disease when we don't correctly produce insulin, and why it's not a disease when we don't correctly produce other hormones that make us feel happy. I think you've got a situation where you have a physical problem. A, there's something physically there that that that, that is that, that is caused by something. Where I said I don't think addiction is, it, I don't think the root cause of addiction is something physical. I think the root cause is you did something. So, so the root cause of ins- uh, of of and I said your body doesn't produce enough insulin. That's actually a lie. Your body produces the right amount of insulin. What happens is you build up what's called an insulin resistance, yeah. and your body doesn't react to the insulin the same. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just to, to to be clear, normally sometimes the, there's, there's something a physical that's not working. Yeah. Whenever you do drugs and you get a lot of feel-good hormones because of those drugs, Mm -hmm. your mind also doesn't react the same to those hormones. Your mind? Your brain. Yeah. Brain and mind are not the same thing. Your brain does not react the same to those hormones, and it doesn't fire the synapses the same. Now, one is your cells do not switch over to ATP production for energy with sugar the same, and one is your mind doesn't fire your brain. Sorry, your brain does not fire the correct synapses anymore from the chemicals. But it's both. You don't anymore react to uh, the the natural chemicals in your body body, the same way that 90% of the population reacts to those same chemicals. Okay, you may be be right. And and, and I can't argue with with you there. I'm I'm looking at your argument. Your argument makes sense to me. Yeah. But I still, I, 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 I and can't. And that's not addiction. That yeah. is that that is an an desensitivity yeah. to those hormones. I can't get myself past this idea that addiction is not. It's not caused by germs. It's not caused by. Uh, but, but, but it's not something you got because you're. Uh, you know, you're in the wrong place. Mm-hmm. It's not contagious. It's it's well, not a disease. I now, would. it may be a malfunction. It may be my body doesn't work right. You know, peop, people and that are... Pe- I can appreciate that. People that are born with a, you know, you know, with a heart, uh, heart valve problem don't have a disease. They have a heart that was born wrong. Right. It wasn't a disease. And yeah. I don't think addiction is a disease. And that's I do fine. think it's a problem. I yeah. do think it's a physical issue. It's just not a disease. Well, and that's fine. And, and that's why... Because um, you weren't characterizing mental illness as a disease either. Um, I don't. But I think that addiction more closely resembles a mental illness than a disease as you're characterizing it. I agree. I agree. I do agree. So Uh, here's what I think as far as the characterization of addiction as a disease. I think that is a – that's a political thing. Um, I say political – I agree. I agree. Because there for a long time – has been this idea that people who are addicted to drugs are inherently immoral. Yeah. And the goal was to begin to shift this idea that those people are immoral. I agree. To it's a disease and it's something they can't help, but they can help and and 
there was always a little bit of contradiction there. But uh, well, what it is, it's an attempt to shift that away so yeah. that we can end the fucking drug war is yeah. what it is. By, by no means am I, am I suggesting that that uh, addiction is, is, is an immoral action. Right. No, uh, I, I'm not saying I'm, you are. I'm just saying that, and, and I want to make this clear, I don't think it is a disease. I do think it's a physical problem. I think there's a physical component. I just don't see it as a disease. Would you call fine, it this? I actually agree with that. But let, let, me, let, me, let me change verbiage because I, I think maybe we're arguing over a certain word and maybe that's not, that's not getting to the root of the question. Would you consider it a mental illness? Like it can be. Uh, I think I think it can be. And, and I hate that word illness there. Do you know? Because the illness rec- represents disease. But I think it's. I think it's. You know, there's there's definitely a mental problem there. Okay. I would accept mental illness because of the way it's, it's the way we use it in, in common language. Okay. Um, and I, I know I'm, I'm I'm splitting hairs here with you, vocabulary. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I get that completely. But that word disease to me has a meaning, and I just it's not a disease to me. Okay. I, do think, I do think addiction can be uh, uh, you, you know, a, a mental malfunction, a mental illness, whatever you want to call it. It can be. I also think that sometimes addiction is, is exactly what people say it is. Sometimes addiction is you made dumb choices. Sometimes it is. Well, sometimes you can make dumb choices that lead to mental illness. Sure, absolutely, so. absolutely. And, you know, you don't... We talk about. I, I mentioned that I, that I don't. I wouldn't call mental illness a disease. There are mil, mental illnesses that are caused by disease. Now that would be different. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't call a. I wouldn't call a low low IQ or being born uh, uh, with a less developed. I wouldn't call that a disease. I would call that you know a physical problem, a malady. There's a there, there's a difference to me. Okay. Anna, any thoughts on, no. on that? Okay. Uh, so something I, I want to talk about here, and and this is going to be more. Anecdotal. I actually have a problem with the uh, way that, uh, oh gosh, Mark Lewis uh, classifies this. He he kind of Doctor What's his fuck. Gotcha. Yeah, Doctor What's his fuck. Um, he kind of mentions this in passing, but then didn't give any details on how the study was conducted or where you can find it. But he mentions so he has serious issues with twelve step programs and the way they're they're structured, the way. And, and, and his biggest problem is that they require you to admit uh, that you're powerless, believe in a yeah. higher power, et cetera, et cetera. Most do. Yes, most most do. And most and his biggest problem that he mentions is the admitting that you're powerless p- part of it. And he says that in doing that, you are giving up the learning portion of your brain that allows you to learn to overcome it because you're saying you're powerless and you're depending on something else. And he cites this study, and this is the study I have a problem with, because the statement can be completely wrong, completely right, depending on how the study was done and how you're interpreting things. He says the biggest uh, determiner, uh, uh, determining factor of whether you're going to relapse is your belief in a 12-step program. But then again, that's where addicts go. Yeah. So... And and you don't. It's call- one of the few resources that addicts have had for a long time. I will say that I have seen twelve step programs work for people. Yeah. And I have seen them be a disaster for people too. Yeah. I think we all have to find our own way. Exactly. So so his whole thing, and and I'm saying this as a uh, indeterminist. So I don't believe in free will, but I have argued before. Sometimes it's necess- The lie is necessary. Um, and his whole thing is that by telling people you have the power to beat this, he also encourages instead of telling people just say no, when people say, I want to go get heroin, say, okay, well, let's talk about that. Why do you want to go get heroin? What's that going to do for you? And and kind of like let them have an intellectual exploration of the thing. And then if, if you want to go get high, I mean, whatever. Yeah. And, and, and that that is a more effective treatment option. I, I got a story I got to tell. Go for it. When I was in the Marine Corps, uh, I, I got pulled over for drinking and driving. I was 22, 23 years old. And uh, to get it dismissed, I had to attend, I've forgotten how many hours of, of AA meetings. And the AA meeting that uh, I went to in North Carolina was across the street from a bar. Mm. And the bar had a big sign outside that if you brought your 30-day sober chip from AA, you got a free drink. That is a true story. 
they would uh, they would give you free drinks if you showed up with your thirty day sober. Free t- alcoholic drinks. Yep. Yep. Right there across the street. Not you like could, free soda. No, no. You went in there and you got a free so wait, drink. Hold up. If, if you I, had a chip that said you were thirty days sober. If I go to an AA meeting, That's not being a not being up. alcoholic, and I just stay in the program for thirty days, I can get a, a free beer. You yes. get a, you get a chip and you can go there and get yes. a free drink. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I just nice. I thought I'd share that story. Yes. I wonder if that happens other places. I don't know. That was a marine base, you know. That was kind of, they were a bunch of assholes. Wow. So they were like preying on some of. People yeah. in some like seriously vulnerable they really positions. Were. They really were because they knew they were going to be killed. You know, honestly, if, if if the price of your beer is a thing keeping you from drinking, you're not really an addict. <laughs> <laughs> that is also true. I just oh like God. the story, yeah. the fact that, that 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 you could do that. You know, yeah. it's so uh, fucked up. But uh, but so so um, do you? You know, and, and this is this is a lot more based on your own life experience because you know, to me, I thought I thought it really interesting because in dealing with addiction, I do it from a very intellectual level. Now that doesn't mean that's everyone's experience, but do you believe that admitting your your own powerlessness is itself a flawed approach, or, or you know, do do you think there's something I, to I, that? I don't think there. I don't think it's a flawed approach. I think it's flawed for some people. I I, I I've seen it work for people before. Um, and I'm not going to question anything that, that, that works for somebody. If it works, for, you know, if, if going to an AA meeting helps you stop an addiction when you're trying to stop, God bless you, go. If going to church helps you, God bless you, go do yeah. it. You know, if, um, you know, I don't know, hanging out in a strip club instead may, may do it for you. Whatever it takes, you do what you have to do to, to, to stop that. Yeah. Mm, same. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I, I think that's that's the bulk of, of what I had. Does anyone else have anything? No, I actually found this interesting, and I wasn't sure I was going to. I was a little concerned about talking about addiction, but uh, um, it was interesting to get to go through here and actually question what I believe, and and uh, I'm finding myself wondering if I even still believe everything I believed coming into this. Uh, awesome. Well, I, I mean, think that's uh, the point I, of the show. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm questioning my position on uh, on mental Ill- illness after these questions. Uh, I think I'm still where I was, but I'm going to have to consider it more. So, yeah. yeah. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed the show, you can hit us up on social media by searching Six Pack Philosophy. Go to our website, sixpackphilosophy.com. Uh, if you want to support the show, make sure we can keep bringing you some super cool shit. You can go to patreon.com slash sixpackphilosophy or go and get some swag at teespring.com slash stores slash sixpackphilosophy. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun and we hope you have too. Cheers. 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 Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 